to Choral Conversations presented by the Johns Creek Chorale and Tapestry Women's Ensemble. Before we start our Choral Conversations, we'd like to thank our patrons. And special thanks to Fulton County Arts and Culture. And funding for this program is provided by the Fulton County Board of Commissioners. Hi, and welcome to Choral Conversations, where we hope to chat about some choral topics that might help you in the classroom and, and also uh, in the concert hall. And today we talk to Holly Dalrymple. Dr. Holly Dalrymple is the Director of Choral Activities at the University of Wyoming. There she conducts bel canto in a collegiate choir, and then she teaches conducting and advanced choral techniques. Before coming to Wyoming, she did a little bit of everything. In Texas, she directed middle school choirs, high school choirs, church work, and then also uh, community choirs. And so she was quite busy and still is busy uh, today. And so we're excited uh, that she is joining us. So thank you again uh, for joining us today. Um, so we're just gonna dive right in um, can you just, today we're talking about choral tone and how, um, how we achieve great choral tone. And so can you describe what your ideal choral tone is? Yeah, great. Thank you, Dr. Frank. I'm so glad to be with you. Um, I think that thinking about choral tone, um, I think it's the most important thing that we get to think about as directors because it's the first thing that a person, an audience member hears in your ensemble. So the very first impression that you want to make on them is that your choir is singing with an even balanced and beautiful tone. Um, I like to talk with my singers, our choirs here. The three words that we often use are spacious, high, and forward. And so um, that's kind of the way that we uh, begin and, and plant that seed of choral tone. Spacious, of course, talking about the oral cavity um, and all the way into the nasal sinus cavities. And then just kind of a, an image of being really quite vertical in the way that we approach our singing. Um, high, of course, talking about placement, that we're thinking about um, the bell canto technique coming up and over on top of the sound. Um, and then forwardness being that we're, we're bringing our sound to the fore of the oral cavity, that we're not um, allowing the sound to fall back into the throat. Um, the most important thing, um, the, the adjectives that I would like to describe in the, the tone that I prefer, um, some of them might be um, warm, rich, resonant, free, and vital. Um, and to do these, of course, we have to have support from a total body engagement. So not just the, the head or the neck, not the, the valving and the control that can come from the throat, but thinking that we're singing with our entire body, body from top to bottom. Um, and to do this, as we're creating this tone, thinking about uh, chiaroscuro, so the, the balance between dark and light, that we're right in between and not overly bright and not overly dark, mm -hmm. um, and that once we are all singing in this way, then of course the next step has to be that every singer in the room comes to complete agreement about their formants, the shades of vowels, the focus, the placement, just a hyper awareness of what each voice is doing. Because every singer in an ensemble could be singing in a beautiful way, but if they don't agree with each other, then we still don't have a sense of, of conformity and you, you know, unified tone. So that's kind of, that's kind of where, we, where we start. Compared to like to sound models, if people are, you know, or I guess when you're picking up music, uh, you know, you know, you know, different eras of music have a different sound model, a different tone model, maybe. And so, where does yours kind of fit? Like, where where's your bread and butter that you like to, you know, sing on a regular day? I mean, I know that you're you're going to change maybe tone and timbre for something, you know, for a desired effect. But you know, what kind of music are you are you exploring with? With this, with this tone. Well, I think um, I, I think you're right. I think we do use our tone as um, we can alter it. You, we can we can paint like an artist. You know, we can use different tone, like different paint colors and different timbres and different shades depending on the the genre and style. I like to approach all with young singers all of our singing with a sound that is, we're thinking about schools of sound. So not overly bright or thin, 
um, that's not shallow. We hear a lot of the that more tone that comes sometimes from younger singers, just as what they do naturally. And so encouraging them to find that more spacious sound. Um, um, I, I prefer a sound that's not driven by uh, individual sounds or voices so um, that we don't have that we create sectional identity that then is um, amalgamated into an ensemble sound mm -hmm. um, being really mindful not to use I think the language that we use in rehearsal is really important um, I think that we can if we're not cautious we can say things about their tone that we don't really mean that can cause constriction and restriction that causes mm -hmm. tension that then can affect intonation. So I, I avoid words like um, straight straight tone. If I want a sound that's a bit more lean, I say that leaning, you know, mm -hmm. uh, stretching, stretching through, leaning, adding, you know, a little bit of um, air pressure. Um, so for us, we don't necessarily, I try to, to program um, a little bit of everything so that they yeah. don't find themselves pigeonholed into just one idea, um, but we, we always approach our sound with these core characteristics to start. Mm -hmm. yeah. So like, let's talk about vibrato. Um, I, I view vibrato as kind of a color or uh, uh, an addition to, you know, to tone. And so, you know, some, some directors let, you know, their choir sing, you know, a, a large amount of vibrato and then others, you know, no, none at all. And so kind of like your ideal, you know, where, where are you on the, on the spectrum and, and, and what do you think is the healthiest for choirs? Yeah, so I think we're kind of right in the middle and I think it's, it's different depending on where you are in the phrase. So if we're at the, at the peak of a phrase and we're traveling at the same speed, then we, we, we will invite a little bit more of that in. Um, I actually, for the most part, I don't use the word vibrato in rehearsal. Almost, mm -hmm. I try to do it very sparingly for a couple of reasons. I think that depending on the singer and their age and their maturity, um, they often don't actually know what vibrato is. And so until they understand <laughs> what it is and how it's created and the fact that we don't create it, that it's a natural byproduct mm -hmm. of proper alignment um, and formant. Um, so I try to to not use words that they, that they might inadvertently uh, try to manipulate, I guess. Um, so I like to, so when there's too much of that in the sound, I call it disturbance. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning that if every singer is vibrating freely in their own unique way. So we try then to experiment with how much disturbance is in the sound that we don't get to where there are beats in the sound in places where the sound is broken um, and that the section can then start to vibrate together. So we definitely need it so that the voice doesn't become fatigued and we don't sing in an unhealthy way. But depending on where you are in the phrase, I very often will specifically ask for no disturbance in the sound as we approach cadential formulas. So mm -hmm. as we come into certain chord structures, so obviously if you're singing something with chord clusters um, and tones side by side, we can't have disturbance or we don't actually hear the clarity of the pitch. But if we're in the middle of something that's really tall and vertical, then we can sing. So I actually taper that or rather construct that based on the harmonic structure of the piece, where we are in the phrase, and who the singer is and what they understand to be about their own vibrato. So I think yeah. vibrato is a really, really, really a tricky and tall uh, subject. Well, that, I'm, I'm glad you said that because disturbance also depersonalizes it to sure. me. Sure. You know, because vibrato is, you know, I can't tell you how many young singers that I teach with on a, on a, on a voice basis, it's not a choral basis, they come in and the vibrato is, is so manufactured and just, uh, uh, uh. and so I, I think using the word disturbance kind of takes that aspect away. Um, then also, I think they get the idea of that the vibrato is affecting the pitch in a way to where it's not personal. You say there's, you know, because they understand that the disturbance is not their, their personal voice. The disturbance is the chord and it's not blocked. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And we're, there, there are some terms that I use a lot instead of vibrato. Um, if the sound is um, too one dimensional and is too, is perhaps um, in the upper register, especially if the sound is, is um, falling is too matte. We talk a lot about, um, we use images like from art. So we talk about shimmer and spin and flow and we use our hands a lot. So I use gesture mm -hmm. a lot to, so that they in their own voice can find that they can, they can, um, An aesthetic relationship. Yeah, there. absolutely. So they can break up that one dimensional block of sound and give it some life. Um, mm -hmm. And also I find that in a section, 
we have to address individual students needs. So it's a big voice lesson. So in my tenor section, you know, there's one, there's one young man that has that manufactured vibrato that you're speaking of. And I have one young man standing next to him who uses no undulation at all. Mm -hmm. So making sure that we know those voices intimately and that you give the right directive with eye contact to the singer yeah. to whom you speak so that it's not, you know, <laughs> so there's individual things. So there's like the, there's, um, there's individual things and then there's global things that are sectional yeah. things and making sure that you have the language to discuss both. I think yeah, really I think, again, the, the, I think you're right on the language is very important to where, because singers, they, we personalize everything. And so I, I'm a big fan of, 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 of building that relationship to where you can look at a singer and say, you know, you can give them a look and they'll know what you're kind of talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so what, what outside factors uh, can affect tone uh, when you're trying to achieve it? Yeah, you know, I think this is a, um, there, there are so many things that can affect our tone. And so we could take time to enumerate each of these, but I think that in my experience, the number one thing that affects a singer's tone is their, um, their preconceived, already established perception of what singing is. So we call that vo voice identity and sound model. So whatever singing has meant to you, what, wherever you... Um, what the or your origin so our sound models come to us through whatever we find in our environment and that comes through our sociology so in what ways do we experience singing on a day-to-day -day basis in our lives that could be in our family perhaps our family has a really rich culture of singing um, that could be in different different styles and different genres coming from different cultural influences it could come from worship so whether you're singing hymns at a Protestant church or you're singing um, chants at a Catholic church, or maybe you're singing um, in a gospel style in African-American uh, praise service. So there's a lot of different ways that singing comes to us that can affect mm -hmm. our students' idea of what it means to sing. And then of course we have our, um, our models from the radio and popular music and whatever whatever art that is. If a, if a young young girl has come to the college program and she was part of a musical theater program, that's mm -hmm. her idea of what singing is. Or maybe there's the young woman who um, has never found her chest voice once. So there are all these sound models that also, there's also um, deep connection to our personalities and confidence. So all of these things manifest themselves into how what we define as singing that's those are the mm -hmm. outside factors so upon entering the rehearsal space we just immediately walk we, from the moment the rehearsal begins we just start making sounds together that are just these neutral open rich resonant and free sounds and we don't call them singing so the first mm -hmm. things i always do in rehearsal are things that i call um like non-specific pitch um activities that are yeah. just experimenting with sound making as opposed to okay everybody now we're going to sing yeah well, here's a thing yeah. what yeah what does sing mean to you so that's kind of how i think that's the most important thing and and I'll, i want to mention this too every single one of those environmental sound models that i just mentioned are completely valid important and worthy to be honored so mm -hmm. we need to make sure that every student, as they walk into our classroom, that whatever singing has meant to them, we need to affirm and honor that, that that was important and it's valid. That we teach them how to sing in different ways in different places, depending on what their outcome goals are. Mm -hmm. As opposed to saying, that's not how you do it. That's really important. Yeah. That's, of course, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it took me a long time in my career to, uh, to validate that the best singing that I did was not the singing that I wanted to do. And so like, I would look down upon that style of singing mm -hmm. uh, and it took me, you know, a long time. And so I, to, to say that, you know, musical theater was just as valid as classical or just as valid as folk or whatever. And now I teach kids that, I mean, they're gonna make more money, you know, singing pop music than I ever would have, you know, and they're gonna be super successful. And so, it's been rather eye-opening in the last kind of seven to ten years that these you know these new students that are coming up that you know are fine with every types of genre and I think that you're doing a good job and if we can keep saying that these are important and that um, that we're building upon those to you know to kind of move into that more classical canon um, I think is important I know for me to, to kind of what you were talking about 
with what we're listening to. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I had a you know big kind of robust baritone, um, and then I started listening to the you know John Rutter Cambridge singers, you know, because our, our magical group in high school was doing that, and so I started to mimic every you know tenor on that recording, and so. I mean, my vocal, my timbre and tone changed uh, and it took a good voice teacher two years to, <laughs> to fix it. And so that's very interesting that, um, about you bring up that the, the biggest factor is not necessarily kind of in the room environmental, but, you know, kind of out of the room uh, environmental. So that's pretty cool um, and pretty interesting. And so I guess my final question is like, you know, once you... Um, once you get them to kind of embrace your, your sound model or your tone model, you know, what are some kind of, you know, besides the exercise you mentioned, the non-specific, are there any other exercises that you would suggest or anything? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think it's, there, there are so many um, different exercises that we could talk about, but I think I'd rather focus on some larger concepts as far as okay. how we structure our rehearsal process. So, um, because a lot of these are, are, are big ideas that if we don't, if we don't have the big idea in mind, the details actually aren't effective because mm -hmm. we, we're not doing them with the, the correct uh, intention. And so some big ideas would be that um, that first seven to 15, whatever you're, you know, I know that we each have a different rehearsal time period. So if mm -hmm. you're in block and you have your kids for an hour and a half, then you might spend longer on this when you do see them. If you've only got them for 27 minutes, then this might be shorter, but per <laughs> whatever your time frame yeah. is, that the, whatever you do in the first 10%, we'll say, of your time with them is absolutely crucial to building your choral's tone, meaning that from the second they walk in the room, the first sound that they make must be a beautiful sound in a healthy place. If we allow that voice building warm up time to become habitual and to become um, just a series of, of exercises that they've memorized and they're not doing them with intention or beauty, there is no way that we can expect the repertoire rehearsal to be beautiful. And so I think it's really crucial that in those first moments, if there's a sound that's not either the one that you want or like I like to say, traveling in the direction of the sound that you want. Right, uh -huh. so we can't, yeah. we can't expect that everyone's going to be great on day one. The first day, but yeah. if you're not moving in that direction, then we always stop, we reassess, and we do it again. And that is especially crucial during the sight reading and the musical skills portion, that they're sight reading using solfege with beautiful singing. So mm -hmm. very often we see um, kind of a, a um, non-intentional warm up time that's just a series of kind of you know mindless tasks and then solfege with a really terrible tone and then we ask them to sing beautifully so we need to redefine singing from the very beginning so some mm -hmm. of the things that we do um, with those non specific things are um, using a hum space so creating a lot of oral cavity space a lot of sirens and glissandos for, to help them navigate their passaggio um, and then creating I like I always like to start on vowels that'll help them with most beauty of tone so o's and oos mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. finding those forward yet open spaces at the same time um, and then I always begin from the top down with young singers because they don't know yet how to navigate their upper voice without carrying the heaviness of their chest mechanism. So always starting from the top and descending. And then once they can do that, then, then allowing them to, to find their chest voice and then learning how to navigate back. So registration is probably the most crucial issue for young the singers. Hardest. Yeah. For, for, for everybody because they, yeah. do it, they do it on their own in their own time. So teaching them how to do that <laughs> on O's and O's. And then the next thing is once we, once we um, have established what that feels like, what it, that we're, we're engaging breath, that we're making sure that they are breathing appropriately for singing. Um, and that when we're teaching our repertoire, this is probably the most important thing that I, in my process that I've landed on in time is that when I'm teaching repertoire that we almost never, even with my university students, we never sing on text at first. Mm -hmm. the, the, comp, the complexity of adding text, if you think about the agility oh, okay. required to travel quickly in through all the different shades of vowel, especially in English, um, where if we ask them to do that at the beginning, then we have never given them an opportunity to make that beautiful sound. So we mm -hmm. teach, we, we, we generally read on soulfish unless harmonically it's doesn't, it's not, 
it doesn't make sense to do that depending on what language the tonal yeah. language is but we always either sing on solfege um or we sing on o and u or i say choose your favorite vowel it depending on the singer um we don't approach text until much later and then when we do add text before we ever sing it we always go through every single text and we use ipa even i used ipa in my junior high choirs as well um i teach them just the the maybe the seven most key sounds that we say yeah. all the time and put that in their music and then i had flashcards so that we i put the flashcard up <laughs> oh e ooh, what's that word shoo you know whatever the word is yeah. so that they learn the sound first and how to sing it off pitch just in a sing song speaking voice mm -hmm. before they ever get a chance to say the word on their own again because if they say the word the way that they say it when they leave the room then there's yeah. no way they're going to sing it beautifully so i go from the backwards to the i i do a kind of a backwards design so we 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 learn how to navigate the vowels first then we speak it on text then we sing it on pitch and text with those with the vowels that we've already together found and yeah. it's it's kind of the vowel because I mean, you have so uh, I mean, just in, I mean, I don't know if it's like this in, in Wyoming, but in Georgia, we, you know, nobody's from Atlanta. They all just moved here. And so different accents abound and it's, it's very hard to find kind of a unified uh, vowel. And so we have to break it down to Absolutely. Your yeah. So di you know, dialectically speaking, we have so many things happening in one room um, that we, that we just, we, we really can't afford to go to text because everyone will make their own decision. And then we don't have that agreement that we talked about earlier. So everything has to be, the, the cool thing about choral singing is that we're constantly agreeing on everything. And if we don't, it doesn't sound good. And so it's, 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 a, it's a absolutely, it's one of the greatest forms of cooperative teamwork that we'll ever get to experience. Yeah. I'm going to still I like it. <laughs> if one yeah. student, you know, if we have, even have one voice then, the better they get, then the one sound that's out of line is so obvious and then they start to hear it too so one thing that's really cool about building tone from the ground up this way with such intention is it's slow moving at first but then they are so proud of it and then it becomes part of their identity mm -hmm. and i that's what i think is really cool about it that if you take that time so i'll mention this too it is so much more in, in my in my world um, it is so much more important to choose repertoire that they can sing beautifully mm -hmm. than repertoire that sounds difficult Yep. So, so part of this process, when we teach from the ground up this way, um, is we have to choose the correct repertoire that will help to make our students successful. So if we're still chasing pitch and rhythm a week before the concert, we should have been done with that a month before that, you know, so giving them at least half of that rehearsal time and making it beautiful and becoming in, you know, coming into an agreement as opposed to what's happening here. So I think that my job is not to teach them what and when i mean it is we do that at first of course it's it's the how i want to spend a lot of time on the how because that's where the reward lies in the in the then creating the the flexibility of all the phrase and the shape and um but you can't do that until it sounds beautiful mm -hmm. and it sounds like you're going from you know kind of a uh, several different angles it's not just a um you know physical you know using of the voice it's also kind of a, a mental, you know, thing you're asking them to think a certain way, you're asking them to move them, maybe their hands a certain way. So it, to where it does, I would imagine it speeds up the process of making that tone part of their body. That's right. So once they learn that that's what singing means in this room, then they will start what I have found over. So I've, I've been with my, um, with my women now for 15 semesters and that first two years, I had to redo this at the beginning of every semester. Something happened in that third year. They walk in the room singing that way. There was enough carryover. Now I have a core that brings this in. And so now we can we can read through really difficult music um, in no time. We can teach things in two or three rehearsals because we don't we don't have to spend all that time starting mm -hmm. from the ground up. Um, one thing you said um, about the gesture, I think that using physical gesture in the choral rehearsal is absolutely critical. So because we, if we're asking them to sing with motion, with forward energy, learning how to thread the vowel, learning how to do all of these things, the fastest way to get there 
is to have the body imitate what's happening mm-hmm. and teaching them how to use their body. And then once they, once the, you know, you're building these new nerve neural pathway connections, once mm-hmm. the, the brain, the voice, the brain will tell the voice to do what the hands are doing or the body is doing, and then we can calm that down. And then the voice has it. So we use gesture a ton. Also for young singers, if you're giving them intentional gesture, it's fewer opportunities for them to use their bodies in other ways that we might <laughs> invite them to do. I learned that when I taught middle school boys. Uh-huh. Um, you know, if I'm giving them something to do with their hands, whether it's with rhythm or with solfege or with sound or with whatever, then they're not whacking each other on the head. And that's yeah. really um, important too. <laughs> it sounds like, you know, that your idea of tone is is a total encompassing kind of hierarchical or, you know, like a, a large arc that you're never really going to, that no choir ever really achieves perfect tone, that it's, it's it, you're trying to, what did you, I think you used a phrase that you're, you're trying to get there or. Yeah, we, we just, yeah, traveling in the direction. Of traveling in the direction. You, okay. yeah. do you, I guess my question is, do you ever get there or do they just become more mature singers? Well, um, I, there, I mean, certainly there's times where I think, you know, that's, that's excellent. You know, I don't know that we stay there 100% of every piece for every performance. No, mm-hmm. but this is, I think this idea of, um, of certain arrival points and their maturation is really important with, for young singers, because it, it's our job to teach them how to sing as beautifully as we can, as opposed to, oh, that's just how kids sing, or that's how a high school sings. That's not, tr- that's just not true. The high school choir or a middle school choir will sing in the way that you taught them, mm-hmm. whatever whatever that is. It just so happens that sometimes um, we equate mature sound with the openness and immature with the closeness, but really and truly they will do whatever you showed them and taught them to do and expected them to do. And it, it just takes time. So mm-hmm. I think that, um, I think that maybe re-envisioning, reimagining what your young choir could do. I mean, for me, that's what I kind of decided to do. I was like, well, I want to make this as good as I can. How do I do that? Another really important thing too is that you can model the sound that you want. You can you can explain it all day long, but with young kids that have three, you've got three seconds to tell them something, right? <laughs> You're going to lose it. And so you, if you can show them my turn, your turn, like this, go. You know, as opposed to you know writing them a dissertation about what it looks like. No, yeah. just just show them. The, mo- the, the, mo- the most effective way that we can show our ensemble something is through nonverbal communication, either with the gesture on your own body or with a sound coming out of your own face. And mm-hmm. then for two seconds, you might say, how was that different? I always yeah. ask the choir to um, use their words to assess how what they just did was different than what they did before. Harness that energy, think of it, imagine it. Okay, let's try it again. So that every time we do it, we're not just hoping for the best that we take that moment of intention <laughs> before we go. Again, so you have precious minutes with your kids. Mm-hmm. So how to use those minutes in the most efficient bell to bell way um, without, you know, so no time with everyone, just, just we don't wanna waste their time. And yeah. that helps them to understand how important it is that they're, what they're doing is important, that it's not wasting time. It's intentional, exactly. it's yeah. meaningful, it's intentional and um, it's worthy of their time and energy. Well, thank you uh, for your expertise. Appreciate you coming on and talking. And we're just going to close uh, the program today by listening uh, to one of your choirs. So oh, to listen awesome. to the beautiful tone. So, uh, and thank you so much. And we appreciate your uh, helping us out with this project. Well, thank you so much. Happy to do it. <laughs>